recording, Nikki? Oh, yep, there we are. Great. Excellent. Um, well, first off, I want to welcome everybody to the Evergreen New Features and Benefits and Project Timeline webinar. For those of you who I haven't been able to meet yet, uh, my name is Leslie Miska, and I joined ODES in February of 2016 as the Information Services Manager. My primary role within ODES is the oversight and management of our electronic data systems, which includes both EIS and futuristically the Evergreen data system. Joining me on today's presentation is um, Nancy Kitchen, who is one of the ODES data uh, and compliance specialists and, the, and an Evergreen project participant. And I believe uh, Walter Goodlett will also be joining if he's not here already. Yep, I see him here. Um, and Walter is um, the Evergreen Project Organizational Change Management and Communication Subject Matter Expert. So uh, Walter just joined us in July and is helping us with uh, this webinar series and preparations for this webinar series, as well as other communications that will be coming out uh, related to the project. Next slide, please, Nikki. Uh, over the over the next hour, uh, what I plan to share is a little bit of project background, a few new features of the Evergreen person record. Um, so this series will be focused on the person record. We do have some future webinar series focused on other areas of the system. Um, a high level project roadmap, including our release three deploy date and your training dates. Some next steps and some details for staying engaged and getting the support that you need as we uh, continue forward with this transition. And then we'll wrap up with uh, some Q&A. We should have at least 15 minutes or so for questions and answers. So throughout the presentation, please uh, feel free to use the Q&A icon in the Zoom meeting and type out your questions as we go. And then when we get to the Q&A portion, I'll answer as many questions as I can um, live in the time that we have remaining but all questions that do get entered into the chat will be responded to. If Even if I can't get to them, we will uh, provide answers to those and we'll send the, we'll post all of the questions and answers on our project website for you to be able to access um, after this meeting. And we'll also be sending out a, an email to communication that will uh, include the links to the project website and all, all of the recorded meetings as well. So you have been added to the meeting in listener mode, therefore your line is muted. Um, so we do ask that all the questions come in through the Q&A and, um, and like I said, we'll, we'll do our best to get to all of them live on the call today. Next slide, please, Nikki. Uh, so the purpose of the Evergreen Data System Project, if you aren't already aware, I'm sure uh, many of you have been reading our email communications and you know some of this, but if you aren't already aware, the purpose of the Evergreen Data System Project is to implement a single electronic data system to replace ODE's three major legacy data systems, EIS, MAPSIS, and MeCare. The project is being completed in a phased approach. So this is the first phase or the first project, and it included three production releases. Our first release was in May of 2019. It was a very small sort of pilot release. And then we had a, our first major release in June of 2020, and that was for our Adult Protective Services and Public Guardianship Conservatorship programs. And then our third release for this first project is upcoming, and that is the Developmental Disabilities and Neurobehavioral Programs release, and that is planned for January of 2023. The primary goal is to enhance the quality of services for our constituents. And some of the benefits of doing that um, include automating some of our current paper or manual processes, reducing redundant data entry for our system users, streamlining some workflows and processes that maybe are a little bit clunky currently, and improving our data and reporting. Next slide, please, Nikki. One of the, uh, over the next six slides, I'm gonna share some of the new features and benefits of the Evergreen Person Record. Please note though, that I'm not gonna be explaining everything that you see in these screenshots. Um, I'm gonna be providing a high level overview of some of the particular features, 
Uh, so I might not point out everything on all of these slides. However, there will be plenty of time for you to explore the new system uh, between now and the deploy in January. And you'll also be able to um, view this slide deck and the recorded meeting after the fact if you want to, you know, browse around a little bit more and send emailed questions, you certainly can. But the first feature I wanted to call out on this slide um, is the robust, centralized, and shared person record. And what this means for you is uh, less redundant data capture. So Evergreen uses role-based access, and that determines which person records that you have access to view, what functional modules and forms you can use and and um, we'll see in the system and the data that you have access to, um, whether you can view it, add edit and or remove it based on your uh, role. Uh, throughout the system, uh, the white bar at the top of the screen, at the top of the screenshot that has the little tree icon and then it says evergreen, that white bar is uh, called the persistent navigation and that will remain constant while you're logged into the system. You will always see that bar and you'll always, always have access to the icons and features that your role sees on that bar. Not every role will see everything that's there, um, but you will always see the same set of icons for your role, no matter what page you're on in the system. Similar to EIS, most evergreen activity is completed within the context of a person record. So, most system users will start their activity in the system by doing a search and likely a person search. And that's what the search does default to. Some user roles have more than person search capability. Many and most roles will just have person search, but it always does default to that. And once you've done a search and you've found the record that you want to work within, you navigate to the person record. That's what's pictured here in the central content. Inside of the person record, the green bar that, that appears right below that white persistent navigation is referred to as the person record banner. This is similar to the content that's displayed within EIS when you're anchored on a person record at the top of the screen. There are a few different fields here. You can um, get acquainted with what uh, the, the items that you'll be able to see um, uh, as you're navigating within a person record um, once you have a chance to look a little bit closer. Um, but the additional navigation items are down the left of the screen. So the primary person record navigation appears down the left-hand side of the screen, similar to EIS. And each icon represents a different page or area within the person record. The top icon is the dashboard, and that's where you'll land when you first do your search. But when I took this screenshot, I was anchored or had navigated into the record icon. So that's what you're seeing in the central content of this screenshot. Um, but between the dashboard and the record is the person summary. And that is just a quick way to find some of the critical information related to this person record. Items like assigned case managers, assigned public guardianship, conservatorship representatives, um, whether they have financial eligibility, if they're on the wait list, what their status is, and a few other items. Um, the record, which is where this screenshot was taken from, is the meat of the person demographics. So that's where you're gonna find all of the things like name, date of birth, the person's addresses, their phone numbers, all of their contacts, any identifiers for them, main care ID, uh, social security numbers, um, eligibility for uh, financial and program. So all of that stuff is in this record icon and page. And the record is a single page. So as a user, you can scroll and see all of the content, or you can click on the toggle icon, which is circled um, by the little red circle in the upper right of the content on this slide. And when you click on that, it will expand this additional right-hand navigation, which is also circled right below that. And this is referred to as the quick scroll. 
And what this does is it shows you all of the sections of the person record and you can click on any one of them and it will automatically drop you to that section of the person record or that card. Sections are also referred to as cards and sections or cards are demarcated by a border that has rounded corners. And I've highlighted with a red border here, the person information section or the person information card. And that's the first card in the record. Uh, users also have the ability to collapse sections or expand sections. When you come in, they're all expanded. It's defaulted to having them all expanded like this screenshot, but you can use the little carrot icon or the V, the little V looking icon that's to the left of personal information. And that would collapse this section and you can collapse and expand them by clicking and clicking again. And you can do that for each section. If your role allows you to, if you have the ability to create records, then you would also see at the bottom of each um, section, a green button that will have plus add and then whatever the name of that section is. And then you'd be able to click on that. It would pop up a modal and it would allow you to add a record to that section of the person's um, file or record. If your role allows you to edit and or remove any records or items, then when you hover over a particular section, you would see a trash can icon for remove and a pencil icon for edit. And if you click on that section, it will pop up the modal for edit if you have the edit ability, or if you click on the trash can, it will pop up a modal and ask you if you're sure you want to delete that section or that record. Next slide, please, Nikki. Some data that's captured or maintained in the person record is displayed on other forms throughout the system in an effort to reduce the need to capture redundant data. So this is another way that we're hoping to reduce that redundant data capture and avoid conflicting data as well. Some examples of this are the health information and history data sections. So this um, slide, I have, when I took the screenshot, I was um, in the health information section. And the health information um, data also has, when you click on it, a sub navigation. So that's the white menu that you see just to the right of your primary navigation, the green navigation on the left. Um, this health information section has sub navigation items of allergies, devices and modifications, treatments and the like orders, diagnoses, medications and health insurance. And so in order to see the content for one of those sub navigations, you would click on whichever sub item you are interested in. This screenshot was taken while I was on allergies. So the all of these pages are what are referred to as list pages and list pages um, appear like an excel spreadsheet or a table format and so you can uh, each record will have its own row and you can sort the data using the column headers so you can click um once to have it sort ascending, descending, and then again to have it um, do the reverse. And um, some of these, uh, some list pages have additional data that's available under the ellipses, which is the three dots to the right of the row. And those might be things like descriptions. Um, and also list pages throughout the system always have a search so that you can sort, uh, narrow your results by the keywords that you're searching on. And that will always appear above the table to the right. And if your role allows you to create new records, you'll see a button, which I've circled in red to the upper left of the table, and it will say plus new, whatever that list page is. So in this case, it says allergy. And you'd click on that and it would pop up a modal and allow you to add the record. And then once you save it, you'd see that record added to the um, rows in the table. And 
most list pages are sorted with the newest or most recently modified records at the top. And then again, you can uh, use your um, column headers to resort that if you choose to. Some um, health information data will auto populate from linked MIMS records. Some examples of this are A number, social security number, date of birth, when the person record is originally created or linked. And then ongoing items like diagnoses, medications, and medical professional contacts will automatically be populated in the record from the claims that are made in MIMS and that update each night um, to the Evergreen system. Um, the history section is also um, a new section and it's, uh, I've circled it in red just below the health information on the uh, green navigation. This history section is another way that we're trying to reduce um, redundant data capture and it's structured to follow the eight top level charting the life course domains. And these domains align with the new comprehensive DD developmental disabilities comprehensive assessment form and the PCP form in Evergreen. Um, and the records that are captured here will be displayed within the comprehensive assessment, the developmental disabilities comprehensive assessment under each of the top level domains in that form. So history records get captured here at the person. Um, record and then when a comprehensive assessment form gets created it will display the history items that have been captured for this person record so that you don't have to go back and forth between that form and the person record and you can see those items to help inform the answers that you're uh, the, the content that you're putting in that form. Other examples of data that displays on forms include things like dates of birth, contacts, uh, especially if there's a private guardianship or conservatorship representative or a natural supporter, um, ass the assigned case manager or care coordinator, an assigned public guardianship conservatorship representative, and there are other, other examples of that as well, but those are some of the common ones that will automatically display when you create a form for the person so that you don't have to recapture that data and it's coming directly from the person record. Next slide, please, Nikki. Data capture has also been standardized as much as possible within Evergreen. And this is to help us improve our data and reporting. So fields that are required to create or save a record so that it's in an in-progress state and you can complete the form are indicated by a red asterisk next to the field name. So I've circled the field name of type here, and there's a little red asterisk next to that. That indicates that this field needs to be populated in order to save this modal and create this record. If a field is also required to complete or submit a form, it will also have the yellow bar to the left of the field itself. So type in this instance is both required to save and required to submit. And that yellow vertical bar um, will uh, may appear in some instances um, where there's not a little red asterisk or vice versa. Uh, many fields will also contain predefined vocab or pick lists, drop down lists. And that's signified by the little V or caret icon that's to the right of that field. So also this type field has a little caret indicator, which means that there's a vocab list. These lists um, are, they work like a predictive search. Some, some are longer than others, depending on the field itself. Um, so if it's a very long list, you can actually start typing the value that you're looking for into the field and it will start narrowing the results that you're seeing by the characters that you've populated into the field. Um, there's typically for most of these fields, there's also a selection of other. In some instances, there are cases where we don't want other values provided on particular forms but a lot of the pick lists will have an option for other as well in case 
the value that you're looking for doesn't exist, you can select other. And in an instance where you select other, you get a text field so that you can populate the value of what that other item is. Other uh, standardizations are date fields. So I've circled the little date icon in the effective date range start date field here. So date fields will have this little icon in them. You can click on it. It will pop up a little calendar, which is a date picker feature, and you can pick your date from the calendar. Or you can just key the date directly into the field. As long as it's in the appropriate format, you'll be able to save the record. If it's not, you'll receive an error message and it'll tell you that you need to properly format it. All fields include some level of field validation to ensure proper formatting, such as um, whether the field only off, uh, allows uh, alpha characters, numeric characters, special characters. Um, text fields also have character limits. Uh, most large note comment description fields have a 10,000 character limit. Um, and there's a little counter under that. So it will tell you as you're getting close to your limit um, and when you've exceeded your limit and it will just give you a, a message and tell you that you can't save the record until you shorten that um, to be within the limit of that field. Next slide, please, Nikki. Evergreen also supports the upload of scanned images and documents to be stored within the person record or in some instances directly within another form. So examples of that are our DD intake and eligibility assessment. You can upload attachments directly to that form. The BI level of care assessment, you can upload attachments to that. We have some uh, forms that are called referred to as packets, application packets, classification packets, attachments can be made directly against those, as well as the person-centered plan. And there are a handful of others that I am uh, don't have listed here. But um, so you can, if the form allows, you can upload the attachment directly to the form, or if not, you can upload it to the person record if it makes sense for it to be at the person record level. And you do that by simply clicking in the file field and searching for the field, the, the um, file, either image or file that you'd like to upload and selecting that from your device. And then you'll see that file name appear in the file field. And then you choose the category that you'd like the file saved under, provide a short description of the file, and then just click save. And then, um, once you do that, it will show you that document in the list page in a new row in that table. And anybody who has access to that person record will be able to view the document or image that you have uploaded. Um, they can view it right within Evergreen, within the browser, or they can download it and view it within the um appropriate software. Like if it's a Word document, they can view it within Word. Um, but nobody can edit your upload besides you and my team. So if you want to change the description, you can do that, but no one else can do that. If you want to remove it, you can do that, but no one else can do that. Um, you do have control over the documents that you've uploaded to the system. Some data, when we go live um, in Evergreen, some data will already have been migrated to the person records. Um, there are certain forms that exist in EIS that do not, will not exist in Evergreen, such as the BMS 99, Psychosocial, V7. We've combined all of those forms into a single form called the Comprehensive Assessment in Evergreen. And the data was not going to migrate in a very useful way. So we're migrating the EIS records as uploaded attachments so that you have access to those and you don't have to go seek that data elsewhere. Um, there will also be, if the person record exists because they're under public guardianship conservatorship, there will also potentially be documents uploaded to the records because our public guardian representatives have been in system since June of 2020. Next slide, please, Nikki. 
The Evergreen View Summary Shade is a new feature. It's located in the person banner, which is persistent within the person record. So after you've navigated into a person record and anytime you're within that person record, you'll have this banner and you'll have this icon for view summary. And this works like a shade. So whatever page or section within the person record you're in, when you click on this view summary, it will drop this shade down over the screen that you're on. And then if you want to remove it from the view, you simply click the view summary again, and it will hide that shade. The intention here is, again, to sort of streamline your process um, so that you don't have to navigate away from a form that you're filling out to go find out what a person's diagnosis is or their medications are or an allergy or who their assigned case manager is or who their emergency contacts are. So it's a great way for streamlining some of your work because you don't have to move away from save and go back to a form that you're working on under that person record. This is a core product offering from our vendor FEI. So we were not able to modify what data appears in here. So these are the data points that are available under view summary, diagnoses, medications, allergies, warnings, language needs, which comes from languages and communication under the person record, um, eligibilities, which includes financial and program from MIMS, assigned staff. So that would be anybody who has an explicit relationship, like an assigned caseworker or an assigned public guardianship conservatorship and any emergency contacts on the person's record. So please note that there is a, both a view summary and then there is the person summary icon, which is part of the left navigation of the person record. And there is some overlap with the data points there, but the person summary icon that's under the person record includes some additional critical data points that we felt were important for you to be able to navigate to quickly. So um, it has some things like living arrangements, waitlist status that you're not going to be able to get from this view summary shade. Next slide, please, Nikki. The final feature that I want to highlight on today's uh, webinar is called Notepad. It's similar to sticky notes. If you have a smartphone or a tablet and you may have used a uh, uh, software like that called sticky notes or something similar to that, it, Notepad is available from your top level persistent system-wide navigation. So you would simply click on the little Notepad icon that I've circled in red on that white bar at the top, and it will pop up this little modal that I've highlighted and circled in red here. And it allows you to add a note title, start typing the description of a note, without having to navigate away from any page that you're on, whether you're within a person record or somewhere else in the system, maybe you're in your notifications, maybe you're running a query or a report or something along those lines, you can just click that little notepad. It, it will allow you to take that note. So imagine you were running a report and you got a phone call uh, from a person that you are um, providing services to and you wanna start taking that information quickly. You can click that icon, start typing everything down. Once you hit save, it will save this note in your staff profile under my notes. And if your role has the ability to create progress notes, you can then navigate to that note and use the little ellipses icon and select the promote to progress note option and turn this sticky note into a progress note that's adhered to a particular person record. So again, just a great way to streamline your um, process and allow you to capture data without having to navigate away from something that you're already doing. Next slide, please, Nikki. So we recognize that one of the keys to a successful transition is to provide plenty of training, thorough training. So to this end, we're going to be offering several types of training, and training will start approximately two months before the deploy. And that will be with a series of 
um, distributed micro learning videos. These are two to three minute videos that you will watch at your at a time that's convenient for you. It's self-guided learning and it will teach you how to do the most basic things within the system. So how to log in, how to do a search, how to upload an attachment, how to create a progress note. So some of the common functions, uh, basic navigation functions, and we'll send those out, like I said, um, towards the end of November, around November 20th, and you'll be able to start watching those. The week after Thanksgiving, some of the ODE staff, um, my team and Angela Faulkner's team, the Community Case Management Liaison team, and a few others will receive some super user training. Those sessions will occur from November 28th through the November 30th. And then starting the first week of December, ODES will offer some webinar format business process specific training sessions. So this will be uh, some focus areas uh, that we feel you may need some additional level of training on top of the technical training that FBI will provide you. And so this will be topics like person-centered planning and service implementation planning process. Um, there may be a couple of others as well. Those training sessions will be offered between December 4th and December 12th. And then beginning in mid-December, uh, we will, FEI, our vendor, will offer role-based technical training webinar sessions. So some roles such as community case manager and BI care coordinator will be offered a series of topics um, over a few days where other roles such as like crisis caseworker or resource coordinator might only be offered the, a single topic uh, that's specific to their functions within the system. All topics that are offered will have multiple dates, uh, offerings on multiple dates and at different times so that we give the most uh, opportunity for people to be able to participate. Um, all training will be virtual and it is optional. We are not requiring the training. However, we strongly encourage it. Um, all, but that said, all training sessions will be recorded and posted to our project website. So if you are unable to make it to the particular webinar training, you will be able to replay the training at a time that works for you. And as many times as you want, and those training sessions will remain available to you even after the deploy. So even when new staff come in and that kind of thing, you'll be able to let them watch these training videos. Um, and they will also li ultimately live within the Evergreen system itself in the Help Center. So um, plenty of opportunity to rewatch the training sessions as well. And then once the training topics have been held, You'll also be provided with access to our training sandbox environment. This will allow you to log in, navigate around, familiarize yourself with the system before the deploy. And then after you've had a few weeks to do that, you know, through the month of December, um, mid-December to the end of December and into early January, um, our vendor FEI will also offer a series of webinar style Q&A sessions. So this will be an opportunity for you um, to come to those meetings with any questions that you've gathered across the training, after you've rewatched some of the videos, after you've been navigating around in the sandbox. We want you to collect your questions, come to those sessions, and we want to be able to answer those sessions for you before the deploy. So those will occur the week of January 9th through January 12th. Um, I do want to just highlight for everybody, as with any large electronic data system replacement project, there will be several obvious benefits of the new system, exciting new things. That said, no system um, and, and no system replacement project is ever perfect. So there will be some issues that we will have to work around until we're able to make those fixes and or until we get to the future enhancements that we have planned for the system. So for this reason, we also, and to make the transition smoother, as smooth as possible, we also plan to offer post-deploy troubleshooting support. That will begin immediately on our go-live date of January 16th. 
And uh, we're still working out all the details for that post-deploy troubleshooting support. We don't know uh, how frequently it will be offered, uh, how long it will be offered, but we certainly will share more details about that as we get closer. Next slide, please, Nikki. This slide shows the remaining high-level project activities that the team will be completing between now and our deploy. So the project team, along with some of our internal business um, staff system users, are already working on the first three activities that are uh, listed in the table. These are all various types of testing and validation of data. And um, along with those is the remediation of any issues that we're tracking. So our vendor FEI is fixing issues as we're tracking those. The first two items are related specifically to testing the functionality and the role-based access, where the third item is specifically related to validating the data that's migrating. Once the functional testing has been wrapped up, the team will begin activities for certifying the system's security and um, with the state of Maine and that the system has achieved its intended outcomes um, with the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. So that's what you see listed as system certification activities. At which time we will also hold our various training sessions. Um, those overlap, those tasks overlap. Um, and we'll complete our dry run or test of the deploy. So the, the project team will be testing the deploy before we actually conduct the deploy. And those will lead up to our deployment weekend, which is uh, what you see in the final row of this table. The deployment itself will take a minimum of three days. So we're currently planning to begin that at 5 p.m. on Friday, January 12th, 2024. And we'll complete that deploy uh, sometime before 8 a.m. on Tuesday, January 16th, 2024. During that three-day window, both EIS and Evergreen will be set into a read-only mode. This is so that data cannot be modified in either of those systems while we are migrating it. At 8 a.m. on January 16th, Evergreen will be turned on for user access, and EIS will remain available in a read-only state, so your credentials will still allow you to log in and you can view data over there. You just won't be able to add any data or modify any data. And that will be available to you for a minimum of six months, but likely all the way through the calendar year 2024. And we'll certainly um, solidify that uh, end date with you as we get closer and we make some of those final decisions. Next slide, please, Nikki. So you might be wondering what's next? Well, for starters, if you haven't already registered for our other two informational webinars that are being offered in the month of November, we certainly encourage you to do so. We'll be sharing information um, about the reportable events form and the progress note uh, form and the enhancements uh, to those two forms at our November 1st through November 3rd series. And then we'll be providing a sneak peek at the streamlined person-centered planning and prior authorization process in the November 13th to 15th series. You can find the links to register for those if you haven't already in the emailed communication that was sent out on September 25th, or you can go to our project website um, and grab those as well. And the project website is on one of the slides um, later in this presentation, but it's um, main.gov slash DHHS slash EIS slash Evergreen. And uh, we also intend to follow up with these series with just a, a quick emailed follow-up reminder directing people to that um, website as well. We also plan to uh, do some additional communications with you in the months of December and January after the webinar series is over, but while you're receiving training, some reminders about training and about the upcoming deployment. So please continue to read our email communications. And um, the other item that you can be doing between now and your training and the deployment is working to clean up your EIS data to ensure that it migrates as successfully as possible. You can find details about how you can clean up your data in EIS uh, by referring to that communication that went out on September 25th. The subject of that was update on Evergreen Release 3 rollout. 
Uh, I'll also state if you didn't receive that communication, it may be because your email address is not updated in uh, EIS. So if that's the case, please reach out to our EIS support team and get your email address updated in EIS so that you are receiving our email communications. Um, and then the last item, the last thing that you can be doing is once we uh, post the registration links for training, which we'll do that uh, sometime in November, likely towards the beginning of the month, um, you can go and register for your role-based training topics um, so that they get on your calendar and you don't miss that. Next slide, please, Nikki. So here's how you can get uh, stay engaged and get some support through the transition. So uh, the first thing that we are very excited to announce is the creation of a network of volunteers called Change Champions. These are volunteers, uh, some of your peers, who will help us with the transition to Evergreen. You can find out more about them by going to our project website and their role and who they are by going to our project website, um, which is listed at the bottom of this slide here. Um, all, all project communications are also sent via email, so please make sure that your email address is up to date, as I mentioned previously, and if it's not, you can send those emails uh, to get that updated to eissupport.dhhs.main.gov. And lastly, if you have any questions or any feedback at all, you can always email us, the project team, at evergreen.dhhs.main.gov. And um, again, you can visit our project website for all project communications get posted up there, all of the recordings from these webinars, all of the recordings from the training sessions, all of the questions that are asked at all of these webinars, as well as training will be posted in our frequently asked questions page out there. Um, and you can visit that anytime it's up and available and has some content, uh, current content at main.gov slash DHHS slash EIS slash Evergreen. Next slide, please, Nikki. And uh, so we've reached the Q&A portion and we do have a little over 15 minutes left. And I do see we have our first question in the Q&A. Uh, it comes from Megan and she's asking, do we need more change champions? Um, and yes, the answer is we would be happy to uh, uh, bring on additional change champions. If you are interested in being a change champion, once you learn a little bit more about what the role is, you can certainly reach out uh, to Walter Goodlett and his email address is walter.goodlett at main.gov. We'll put that um, email address in the chat for you. They Two can T's. see the chat, right, Nikki? Two T's. Two T's, yeah. <laughs> I think they can see that. If not, I can type it in right quick. I am putting that in there right now. Oh, yep, that's it. Two T's. Two T's. Excellent. Yes. So um, if you're not already a change champion and you are interested in being a change champion, please uh, email Walter directly and he'll give you some additional information about uh, what a change champion is. Um, but certainly it's a group of individuals who uh, will help support their peers through this transition and they'll um, meet with Walter and Nancy Kitchen and myself on some regular cadence, um, which is still being determined, uh, to get information about the, the system so that you can help respond to questions from your peers and um, provide additional details to them about the system and the deploy. The big thing about them, Leslie, as we've talked about before, is to change champions work at the grassroots level. Yes. They are the link between the project team and their peers. Yes, thank you, Walter. Appreciate that. Oh, and it looks like maybe Nikki had beat me to the punch too. So we put your email and address in there twice, Walter. So they've definitely got it. Thank you, Nikki. Um, any, uh, I don't see any other questions in the Q and A yet. So, uh, there is still 15 minutes left. Please feel free to type your question into the Q and A. If you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Looks like Nikki also put our project website, uh, link into the chat. Thank you, Nikki. You are so on top of it. We really appreciate your help. Got 
guys are a quiet group. I have to believe that there are some questions out there. Ask away. I would love to be able to answer them. Well, I don't see any more questions coming in, so I certainly want to be respectful of everyone's time. Um, so we will go ahead and adjourn today's session. The posting, uh, the recording will be posted out on the um, website. If you, oh, Megan, Megan, right at the last minute, she gave me another question. Will all case managers be able to update the client record or only supervisors? Great question, Megan. So if you are assigned to a person record, you will have a case management assignment. You will have ability to see that person record and edit that person record. That's a great question. Um, but also if anybody else has any other questions, uh, Oh, great. Cheryl has a question. EIS has critical information feature that identifies emergency level for, for people. Where will Evergreen house this? This is a fabulous question, Cheryl. Um, so the critical information is going to be found in the person record under that person summary icon that I was referring to. That's one of the pieces of critical information that was not part of the summary shade, but that we wanted you to have at your fingertips. So you'll find that when you navigate into the person record and you click on the person summary icon, it's the second icon down. Are there any other questions? If you think of any questions after we wrap up today, you can certainly email those questions over to us at evergreen.dhhs at maine.gov. And we'll certainly reply to those and we'll add those as well to our FAQ. Um, and we'll be populating all of the questions and answers from all of the sessions into our FAQ on our, on our project webpage. So there may have been questions at another session that maybe you didn't think of. So please feel free to visit our project website, read all the FAQs that are out there, continue to read them after each of these series. We'll update it with all of the questions that come in from all of the different sessions. And with that, I don't see any more questions in the Q&A, so I will adjourn us for today. Everybody have a fantastic evening. We really thank you for joining us today and definitely get signed up for our November series. <laughs>